Indonesia Lunch Dialogue brought to you by the Lippo Group at the World Economic Forum on East Asia. Secretary Cesar, I was just thinking of taking the discussion onto a regional level. The Philippines is the second largest market in terms of population in ASEAN. How do you, as one of the fellow giants of ASEAN, view the prospect next year of the ASEAN economic community? Is it just going to be an opportunity for large corporates and corporates from countries which have saturated markets, my own country, Malaysia, Singapore, and possibly Thailand? to exploit the opportunities of the giants. How will the countries such as Philippines and perhaps Indonesia take advantage from this change? Uh, thank you, uh, Karim. Uh, there's only one giant in uh, ASEAN, and that's uh, Indonesia. Without uh, Indonesia doing well, without uh, stability in Indonesia, without economic growth in Indonesia, the rest of ASEAN uh, will not be uh, growing as uh, fast, will not be as healthy. What are the challenges to an integrated ASEAN? The integration of ASEAN is not preordained. The countries must make it happen. Among the challenges that I see would be one, infrastructure. We've been talking about infrastructure in the, the past two days. But if we are to make it one market, we need to connect the countries, especially archipelagic countries such as Indonesia and the Philippines. We need to increase investments in infrastructure. There is money in the region. Uh, another challenge would be how to deepen the financial market so that the money in the region can be recycled to make it easier to finance that infrastructure. Right now, we're sending our money to Western capital markets. Third, we need to invest in our people, but education is the key to making sure that the hundreds of millions of people between our two countries become productive participants in the integrated ASEAN market. We need to have a common customs border. Obviously, that won't happen uh, overnight. No? But I believe that creating a common customs border builds confidence about the member countries. Because without a common customs border, there will be always games. And when there are games, the trust will not be as high as what would be needed in opening up markets, in opening up countries, and making countries more vulnerable, especially politically, in each uh, uh, one's uh, area. Fourth, we need to look at uh, how we can accelerate the harmonization of our standards, of our rules, because an integrated market really is just a word without harmonized standards, harmonized rules, harmonized processes. And finally, we need to trade more with each other. Right now, intra-ASEAN trade is only at 25%. And right now, the bulk of our trade is in intermediate goods and in raw materials. We need to increase intra-ASEAN trade in terms of final consumption goods. Because if we're able to increase that, then we are able to reduce our vulnerability to foreign export markets. And I think we, the members of ASEAN, must not lose sight of the potentials, but also be aware of the challenges. And we must make sure that in our respective domestic uh, uh, policies, no, uh, we must not go for the easy solutions. Because in integration, there will be winners and losers. But I would like to say that there will be more winners. Thank you very much, Secretary. Now, I'm afraid we don't have any time to take questions from the floor. But uh, as I see it, uh, some of the key takeaways are the need for courage and uh, focus in policy uh, formulation and execution. Can we move the countries of ASEAN, and especially the giants, away from purely being consumption-driven in terms of economic growth? How can we deepen manufacturing capacity to provide better jobs, um, deepen also financial markets, the investment in education to upgrade 
and provide a, a much better workforce in order partly to attract the type of manufacturing jobs that we're after. And then, find, and then also the harness the demographic dividend that we were all talking about, but coming on to the broader scale, it's a political challenge. Harmonization of standards, looking at trade issues from a win-win, as opposed to identifying small centers of interest. Thank you very much, and thanks also to the panel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with that, the Indonesia lunch is concluded. Thanks very much to Lippo Groot, and thanks to all of you. Thanks. Over the last 15 years, Indonesia has made remarkable progress. We've achieved stable economic growth. We've achieved free and fair elections. We've achieved regional stability. We're a member of the G20, and the list goes on. Having achieved the economic growth that we've achieved, having achieved the stability and the success that we have had over the last 15 years, as we look forward, we are faced with a new set of challenges, the challenges that are common not only to Indonesia, but also the region and the world thinking not only free and fair elections, but effective governance and restoring trust in public government, thinking not only about GDP growth or per capita GDP, but about quality of life and making sure that everyone has access to education, everyone has access to healthcare, and everyone is able to live a meaningful life. And that is the Indonesian dream. The Indonesian dream is not a dream of individuals, it is a dream of a whole country. And until everyone in Indonesia and the region is able to have that opportunity, we have not achieved that Indonesian dream.